Ventura that resulted in former serfs right, of feudalism getting a lot of freedom. In Eastern Europe, that ended up with the serfs getting less freedom. Right, so post-Black Plague is where we see the West and the Eastern part of Europe really divide. Right? And the Western Europeans are going to gain more rights and more freedoms that they'll lose briefly to the absolute monarchs of the 1600s, which we'll get to. Um, and then in the East, things are not great. So what I did was I, I kind of gave an overview. Um, in France, Spain, and England, the monarchs are going to unify their countries and do a pretty good job of defeating the last remnants of feudalism, namely the nobles. Right? So they have to take care of the noble power. And this is going to be a time where France, Spain, and England are all going to be more unified. So, if you are thinking in generalities for the test, and you're like, okay, what was going on in France in the 1400s? Oh yeah, they're unifying, right? Out of those three, Spain is going to do the worst job of unifying, but they still unify way more so than the Italians, way more so than, than, than the Germans, and um, you know, we'll talk about Russia. Germany and Italy stay fragmented. Italy has their city-states. Uh, we'll talk about those. And then in Germany, you have all of those different principalities that will ultimately get tied into a Holy Roman Empire. But they're very much fragmented, very governed by themselves, very independent. And then you have the Russians. Then in the 1400s, are going to finally get out from under the thumb of the Mongol control, started by Ivan I and then, then finished by Ivan uh, III, known as Ivan the Great. And then, you know, that period will be called the Muscovy period. So this just gives you kind of an overview of the big countries in the 1400s and kind of what they're doing, right? When we look to Austria, right, they're a part of what we're considering Germany and eventually the Holy Roman Empire. Um, you know, the Netherlands and the, the Scandinavian countries are going to be controlled by the Holy Roman Empire as well, right? So the big five, um, and then adding Russia as the sixth countries uh, are up here. So for the 1400s, you have to make sure you could say a little something about each of those, whether it's that the Mongols, uh, the Russians are getting up from the Mongol control, fragmentation, things like that. Who's the most powerful of the 1400s? No one really, right? This is not a period where anyone's going to come to dominate the others. By the 1500s, we'll start to talk about dominating countries, and Spain will be the first. Okay. Questions? Is that ringing bells? Yeah, right? Um, any, you guys remember feudalism? We don't want to talk too much about it. But feudalism was like the power of the nobles, they had the serfs, and the king was just a figurehead. Well, now we're starting to see that system really come to an end. Some other things going on. The Byzantine Empire will fall in 1853. Oh, don't write, don't write, just kidding, don't write. So Byzantines fall in 1853, and now the Ottoman Empire has an opening to Eastern Europe which is going to make those Eastern European kings far more reliant on the nobility because they need their military support. Because the Ottomans are going to, going to present a real threat to Europe until the kind of the late stages of the 1600s. Right, and then of course at the end of the 1400s, Spain and Portugal take the lead in exploration. Yep, like what would the nobles do for military power? Well, they have their, their own private armies at this time. It's like every noble had an army. Right, the nobles had their own armies. And then they would give the king the use of the armies in exchange for land, in exchange for recognition of rights and things like that. Now, we'll talk about how in Western Europe, they're going to be able to directly tax the new middle classes, and then they don't need the nobility. Then they just build their own armies. And that's where Eastern Europe, because their nobles are so powerful, the kings... If nobles are powerful, kings are not. And then I just reminded you guys of the Treaty of Torres Illes, which gave Spain control of all of the New World except, except uh, but 
Fraser, I expect. Uh, Portugal uh, got Brazil. Sorry, I, I set the world record for creating a PowerPoint with this one. So if there's typos, I'm, I'm sorry in advance. Okay, questions on that, All right? So that just gives you some of the fringe details that are going on during the 1400s. All right, Byzantines fall, Ottomans rise, Spain and Portugal begin exploration, right? Portugal had been exploring the west coast of Africa starting the 1450s, and then, you know, Spain after a military defeat, which, or a military victory, which we'll talk about, Columbus shows up and says, hey, you got any extra money? She loaned me to use some ships and Spanish did. Also in that shop because they're practicing Indian dancing next door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to start uh, with the most western of the Europeans and kind of move over from there. When we look at the political map of Spain in 1000, it is very much fragmented. A group of people called the Moors who were Muslims from North Africa had come up and taken control of Spain. And then when we fast forward and we look at Spain in the early 1400s, the Muslims have far less control. They have the southernmost portion, Castile, Aragon, have largely pushed out the Muslim influence. Navarre up top in the north is very much controlled by the French and Portugal as an independent kingdom. Right, 1469, this is all going to change. Right? Isabella and Ferdinand get married in 1469. They bring the two biggest parts, sorry, Castile and Aragon together. Until the 1470s, Jews and Muslims lived in relative peace. Now I say relative because post-Black Plague, Jews were really persecuted all over Europe. Um, and a lot of Jews converted in Spain uh, to Catholicism, and they were referred to as New Christians. Um, those New Christians are going to become a target of Ilibet, uh, Isabel and Ferdinand. All right, so what they try to do, break the power of the nobility, the tradition of local government, and also the influence of religious minorities, mainly Jews, Muslims, and also those New Christians. And really they set themselves up to be, uh, you know, the pillar of Catholicism in Europe. Now, the papacy at this time, this time still has a ton of power in Europe. So being an ally to the Pope, right, is a pretty good thing for your country. And this is a time where the Popes are arguably more concerned with things of the Spain but with a promise that they're going to help the Catholic Church have a lot of power in the rest of Europe. And now remember, this promise is going to come back to bite Spain in the butt about 100 plus years from now when Philip II decides, like, I need to re-Catholicize all of Europe, and that's when he goes and tries to attack, uh, you know, Britain, which leads to the Armada. And so, like, this alliance then leads to some bad decisions down the road for the monarch. All right, uh, 1478, the Spanish announced that they are going to expel and target these quote-unquote new Christians and then Jews. There was about 200,000 Jews living in Spain in 1478. Most of those 200,000 are going to leave. Uh, those that don't leave are going to uh, be very much persecuted. The Inquisition was a very violent uh, period of time in Spain. Yeah. All over. I mean, Northern Africa, a lot of them go to France, a lot of them go to Britain. Okay, this is Northern Africa. Thank you tonight. I mean, no, Muslims in general are religiously tolerant. The Muslims still control a good chunk of Northern Africa at this point. Uh, okay. yep. Have they always been like prosecuted against? Or? Quite a bit. Yep. Uh, the 
takeover, the Catholic takeover of Spain was called the Reconquista. Right? It ends in 1492 when Spain takes over Grenada, which was that southernmost city. And by 1512, Spain was you know, pretty much unified. Muslim influence had been reduced. Isabella had announced in 1502 that Muslims are expelled from Spain. Right, so that Spain that at the beginning stages of the 1400s and even up to the reign of Isabella Fernand was relatively religiously tolerant, they've gone completely the other way. Hmm? Like when it was Isabella Fernand, was it like they both had power or was it he was just like mainly in power and she well, sort of lost? No. She still has power of Castile, he still has power of Aragon, and they're loosely working together. Right, and that's what you know the last part of this Spain five will be is as much as Isabel and Ferdinand did, and as unified as Spain will get in relation to Italy, they're not going to be nearly as unified as France or England. Yeah. What was the article that um like put the country before the religion? A politique. Yeah, if you put either your country before your religion, but we're not there yet. Right, that the 1500s we'll talk about like Henry the Fourth and Elizabeth the First. Wait, is this going all the way through the 1600s? No, we're just going to 1500. Next week we'll do 1500. All right, so you don't have to write all this down. This is just the summary of this, right? So although Isabel and Ferdinand pursued a common foreign policy, Spain existed until about 1700 as a loose confederation of separate kingdoms, each maintaining its own parliaments, laws, courts, and systems of coinage and taxation. So they were loosely united by the fact that the, the king and queen of the two biggest parts were married. Ultimately, there was still a lot of autonomy. And the confederation means that you pretty much still govern yourself. Right? So if you get, you know, in last year, so you're not going to get this essay question again because that was last year. It was asking to compare the fragmentation of Italy to the unification of Spain in this time period. But you could definitely get a free response question. or. Uh, a multiple choice question, or even potentially a DBQ. All right, so this time period, when, when we end the 1400s, Spain's power is on the rise, right? They're, they're gaining lots of American colonies. They made an agreement with the, uh, the Catholic Church. And for the 1500s, they will be the most powerful country in Europe. But it's going to last, you know, until 1588. Uh, I just wanted to remind you about a, a random detail as we start to talk about England and France. Starting early on in the, the 1330s, right, lasting more than 100 years, uh, England and France were involved in the Hundred Years' War, which ends in 1453, really taking its toll on both countries, but giving a major opportunity for the monarchs to kind of take over a little bit more absolute power. So, 100 years war not really covered by the course, but, you know, somehow you get a pre-response question about that time period, you could bring up as just background history. What are we liable to? 1400, uh, 1459. Okay, so France, you have a guy named Charles VII, who's going to govern. Uh, he's sitting as the, uh, the war comes to an end, when Joan of Arc makes her triumphant debut on the scene. She believes, uh, you know, she puts her support behind Charles VII and thinks that he should be coronated to the throne. He's going to reorganize the royal council. Um, he's going to make a lot of alliances with the new growing middle class. The taxes on salt and on land are going to give him the money to create the first permanent army in Europe. Right. He forms something called the Pragmatic Sanction of Borges, uh, and that gives the monarch control over the French church, right? Pretty much he's like, I don't, it's not fair that Spain got some this alliance with the church. We're going to essentially try to do the same thing. Now, in the 1500s, we're going to talk about something called the Habsburg Valois War, which was between France and the Habsburgs that were in the Holy Roman Empire, and how France, to get money, is going to have to make a deal with the church, essentially undoing this. Well, you should see a common theme in England and in France and even in Spain that you have to try to reassert your authority over the church and break the power of the nobles. Right? That's how you become a centralized monarch. 
And then we have Louis XI and XII. They use more tax revenue to improve the army and increase that centralized control. So by the time we're done with 1500, you know, we get to uh, 1515 and Louis XII is on his way out, he leaves to France, is pretty well unified, has a strong army, has tax revenue coming in. It's just a Habsburg Valois war ends up being a really bad idea. Under Louis the Thirteenth, he's the one that has Cardinal Richelieu, and they have like the whole intended method. Right? He's the one that puts him on the road to absolutism. But there's a bunch of Francis's and Charles's between yeah. Louis the Twelfth and Louis the Thirteenth. There, this is like the, pretty much from 1450 to 1550 is the road to absolutism, especially in Western Europe. And then by 1550, most of the Western European monarchs are absolutists. Okay, so that leads us moving upwards to England. 1455 to 1471, they had something called the War of the Roses. Essentially, after the, third, uh, the Hundred Years' War ends, there's a conflict over who's going to govern. You have two big, powerful families, the Yorks and the Lancasters, and ultimately Edward IV, who was a York, but he very creatively took the red rose and the white rose that were the symbols of the Yorks and the Lancasters. He puts them together, and he says, oh yeah, I'm a tutor. Right, so he starts, he gives it a new name, he gives it a new symbol, and he starts to establish peace. And then he says, well, I'm just not going to go to war with continental Europe anymore, and I don't need the nobles, because I don't need your tax money to, to fund a war. Right, so he establishes peace, and that allows him to not go to the House of Commons or the nobles to ask for money. Now, England had had a tradition of parliamentary government all the way back to um, King John I. In 1215, he had been forced by the nobles to sign something called the Magna Carta, which limited the king's powers. So England always had a somewhat limited monarch by the, because of the presence of the House of Lords and their parliament. Right? And the, this will be the period where that will be somewhat minimalized. We had two more English rulers, uh, Richard III, who's barely there, and Henry VII. Henry VII is really the guy. Henry VII and VIII are really the two guys you want to know. They further kind of solidify the power of the monarch, uh, and they do a really good job of keeping England out of continental affairs. And once the Treaty of Tordesillas was announced by the papacy, that makes the English realize, like, we need to start exploring. And by the time Henry VII takes power, the English have really been sending out, uh, you know, some exploration of the Americas as well. They don't want to be completely left behind. So how much earlier did all the other countries start exploring before they did? A solid 10 years, I mean, a solid decade. Like, the 1490s was, was Spain and Portugal alone. Okay, moving over more, we will go to Italy. Um, Italy in 1494, we have city-states. There are five main city-states. The one that we absolutely want to make sure we know is Florence. That's the one where the Medici govern. That's the one that Machiavelli is from and writes about. And then Naples, the Papal States, Venice, and Milan would be the five, if you could remember them, but you've got to know Florence. Divided into numerous city states, they had no tradition of centralized rule. Right, those are the five biggies. We know Florence was the center of banking and the wool industry, and also will become the center of the Italian Renaissance. Right, they had disposable income, they had money, 
they spent it on, on art and the patronizing of artwork. Right, so each of the city-states was very much independent. They had their own armies, had their own government, they had their own cultures, and they just refused to work together, right? Which we know that lack of unification left Italy very susceptible to foreign invasion. The habsburg Balois War between the French and the Austrian Habsburgs will be over who's going to control Italy. You know, even in the 1860s, when Italy's moving towards unification, France still is playing a role in, in Italian affairs. And France is the one who can, like, bully the invade invades on the retreat zone at this time? Right. I mean, the Italian, or the, the French and the Austrians are primarily the ones that are going to um, give Italy the hardest time. I mean, and when you think geographically, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and they become the center of the Renaissance, which we'll talk a little bit about, uh, kind of on its own at the end. All right, so that leaves us with the Holy Roman Empire and what I, you know, always think that students really struggle to understand. There are a number of different cities uh, within what we now call Germany. One of those being Austria. The Austrians had historically been governed by a family called the Habsburgs. In the 1300s, uh, the Holy Roman Empire decides that they are going to elect an emperor. Right? So it's not going to be hereditary, it's going to be done by election. But once the Habsburgs get elected, they prove themselves to be relatively effective as leaders, and they're going to be elected Holy Roman emperor, Emperors from the time of Frederick III all the way up to the 1800s. All right, so since 1356, they were an aristocratic federation, which means they all governed themselves. They had one emperor that was elected by the seven largest states. Similar to Spain, but in the Holy Roman Empire, they're even more independent and autonomous. Yes. Like, why are they called the Holy Roman Empire? Like, is the no. is, isn't that in like by Rome? Yeah. And I and I one time read a thing that said, well, you know, the Holy Roman Empire. They weren't holy. They're not Roman, and it's never truly an empire. Um, it goes back to a guy named Charlemagne that takes over in the 700s. Takes over that area. He had support of the church. He believed that he was like another incantation of Rome, and he actually built a relatively large um, holding of land. That was all land in continental European land, so somehow it got the name Holy Roman Empire and stuff. Um, but it's not really Holy Roman or an empire. Well. All right, Frederick III is our, our guy, our emperor, that our Habsburg that is governing. Um, throughout this time period. If you remember when we talked about, or if you don't, write it down. When we talk about the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburg, you want to think diplomatic marriages. Right? That's how they built their land. Now, they are going to get into a war with France, the habsburg valois War, and then we know the Thirty Years' War will center there. But they are no doubt um, most famous in this time period for their diplomatic marriages. Isn't the Thirty Years' War put them on a spiral? Oh, yeah. Maximilian I takes over. He's going to add more land with the marriage of Mary of Burgundy and their kid, you know, their um, Maximilian and Mary's kid is going to marry Joanna of Castile and their kid Charles V will be the guy that takes over when Maximilian dies, right? And that's when their empire is massive. So this is a, the 14, from 1450 onward is a time of consolidation of land for the Holy Roman Empire and kind of building the power. But the heyday of the Holy Roman Empire is under the reign of Charles V, so we're not quite there yet. All right, their enemy always is France. Right? Think about Germany and France as always being enemies. There's not going to be a time in this class where we ever talk about Germany or the Holy Roman Empire and France being friends. Right? They're constant enemies. 
whether it's during the Habsburg Valois Wars, whether it's during the Thirty Years War when France was supporting the Protestants just to kind of get at the Habsburgs, whether it's during the Franco Prussian World War One, World War Two, France and Germany slash Holy Roman Empire, always enemies. Secure our are they friends now? Um, I mean, they're both parts of the European Union, and Germany is like carrying the European Union on its back. So, I don't know. I mean, I would be friendly if I was friendly. They're not, they're not open enemies. I mean, they work together diplomatically now. All right, so numerous conflicts with France of the 1400s, which sets the stage for the Habsburg Valois War, which will start in 1519. Um, and if you guys remember, when we made those timelines, we at one point made like a timeline of the 15 and 1600s. Um, if you have those, you can dig those out for next week. Those would be very, very useful. Uh, Julian's looking very uncomfortable. Like, what timelines? No, um, have it. Okay, if you have it, definitely dig it out because that will be the, really the foundation for what we will do uh, next week. All right, so then Charles V is going to be the guy that comes along, right? And he's really, he takes over in 1519. He inherits a massive throne uh, from his parents, Philip of Burgundy, Joanna of Castile, and then all the Habsburg lands. So he's the guy that has Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, the Spanish holdings in the America. He controls it all. Mm -hmm. Isn't it, like, hard to control that? Yeah. Like, back in, like, like yeah, and he's not a totalitarian by any means. Okay. So when I say he controls it, right. they all pay taxes okay. to him. But yeah, you're 100% right. He's not making laws that are then being put in place in Spain. Does it sound like when like, a lot of the taxes were being taken away from the ability and that would bring him over? Um, getting all the taxes that. Well, is this time the, the did tax? You, didn't you say that like in France people would have to pay taxes, but then like it would get stolen and not all the taxes pay were going to go to? Oh right, because right pre yeah I know before the kings created a bureaucracy where they had people that were completely um, dependent on them, they would have like independent tax collectors, and those independent tax collectors would would really take advantage of those people, no doubt. This era before bureaucracies really come about are no doubt that's happening. All right, I just put this on here about Poland and Lithuania. I don't know why, like I, I feel like we're just uh, at some point we're going to get a Poland Lithuania question. Um, Poland and Lithuania, they at one time have a relatively large holding of land, but they're not centralized. Uh, they have nobles that are constantly competing. And very quickly, Poland is going to be partitioned by the Hungarians, the Russians, and eventually the Prussians, and Lithuania will be taken in by Russia. But there's a very, very brief period where Poland does have some power in the, the 1400s, but you'll see here, right, the, you know, that it's going to be lost more and more. All right, so Muscovy, Russia, um, this is a phenomenal map. Uh, no, really, like the it's a terrible map. But uh, Muscovy, Russia, is centered in the westernmost portion of um, the city of Moscow. Uh, so under the control of the Mongols in the 1200s, all the way to the late 1300s. Um, if you jump way back to the 900s, um, Russia was centered in Kiev, which is now part of Ukraine. The Kievians governed Russia for about a 250-year period of time. They were actually the ones that broke from the Catholic Church and established the Eastern Orthodox Church. But then they get taken over by the Mongols, and the Mongols will rule Russia in the 1300s. And then Ivan the I in the 1300s, I know it's a little bit outside of our time frame, but bear with me, he begins to break away from the Mongols. They called them Ivan money bags. Yeah, yeah, because he was the tax collector, and then Ivan the Third. Obviously, there were many rulers in between, not just Ivan the Second. 
Um, he's called Ivan the Great. Our book called Mongol Control the Mongol Yoke. And that, you know, is going to be the period of Muscovy Russia, where Russia centered in Moscow. Russia definitely struggled, struggled with a stronger nobility, and it won't be until Peter the Great that comes along that he somewhat breaks the power of the nobles. So if you remember, Eastern Europe is in generally, or generally 100 years behind. David Rainsdow, 50101. David Rainsdow, 50101. You know what I like to do when people do that? I like to call that number really fast, and then like... Because <laughs> then the person can't get through. It's funny, no? All right. And then they pick up. You pick up. They're like David. Yeah. And then they start telling you something that Rain is supposed to know. It gets awkward sometimes. All right. So um, yeah. So the Russians in the Eastern Europeans hundred years behind. Uh, that's why the age of absolutism in, in Europe will be in the 1600s. In Eastern Europe, it will be the 1700s. All right. So that is our lightning fast survey of what's going on in the countries governmentally, and now we're just going to talk a little bit holistically about what's going on overall. That leaves us with the Renaissance, right? The intellectual movement that starts in Florence and spreads from there. You need to know the four isms of the Renaissance, the individual, the classicism, the secularism, and humanism. The Renaissance is very much, um, they, they benefit very much from the invention of the printing press, from the increased trade that centers in Florence. Yeah? What's the word for the language that the printing press made? Like, well, vernacular is the local language. So the printing press makes it so that you can have things in your local language. Um, Wait, where was the printing press made? Well, it was actually invented in Korea, but much like most of the other things that we have in the world, the Asians did it first, and then we copied it, and, and like, you know, made some minor improvements, and then in Germany, uh, Gutenberg really kind of, you know, solidified. So Northern Renaissance, as you move up into Germany, into England, the Renaissance took on a far more Christian tone. Um, if you remember when we read the book Utopia by Thomas More, More was a northern humanist, as was a guy named Erasmus. Right? Erasmus is the guy that you absolutely want to know when it comes to the Renaissance. He said education is the key, and that Christianity does not need the formality right, of the church. He kind of lays the groundwork for the Protestant Reformation, but... What do you mean by formality? Like, like you didn't need like the, the structure of a church. He thought, look, you could have a relationship with Christ without the church. Yeah? Who's guy from Well, a guy named Petrarch starts the, the humanism which leads to the Renaissance. Where is the I don't know. Uh no. <laughs> French Canadian Huckleberry Finn. No, it's, I agree. I would bet you one million dollars. Um, I don't know where it's from, honestly. I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Are you allergic to anything, Mr. Turner? Uh, not really. Definitely not peanut butter. Not peanut really. We didn't want to have a bad story. And, um, no, I, I feel like it's Scandinavia as well, but I just... Uh, Holland, yep. Yeah, Netherlands. Okay. All right. So, Erasmus is the guy of the Renaissance you need to know during the uh, 1400s. Um, some other things of the Renaissance, if you remember, art and the artists begin to play a really central role. Um, you know, art follows the isms of the Renaissance. Now, there was also a free response question last year on, um, you know, art 
and actually it was specific to Renaissance art. So I don't see that being another a question again this year, but we can't we can't necessarily bank on that. Um, and for those of you guys that have been here more than one time, I apologize to show you all this again. But if you have never seen this website, which if you haven't, that means you never listen when I talk. But that's all right. Uh, this is the College Board's website. What they do is they give you access to all the previous questions, free response, and DBQs that they've asked for the past 10 years. Do they do multiple choice, too? No. I don't know why they, they don't. They're very, like, they keep their multiple choice hidden. Have ever repeated a question in like the past few years? Or, or, no. Can you like no. pull like plan check and like calculate a formula? No. <laughs> Way uh, next FRQ is going to be. So like, this was last year's compare and contrast. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. Two years ago was the Renaissance one because that the picture of. Uh, no. Sorry. Well, it's not. It's not uh, worthy of our time at all. So. Yeah, no, I've done, I've done no statistical analysis of when. You also have like people from the yeah, and we have like men on the inside. Yeah, like, he had this guy who was like across the street from the person who makes the test or something like yeah. that. Yeah, no. Um. All right. So that is the survey of the 1400s. Uh, you know, obviously it's all going to lay the groundwork for the 1500s, which is going to be, in terms of events, a far more busy time period. Um. But it just. It starts in the in the second half of the 1400s, really the 1480s, and then onward from there. So, um, questions. One of the things that we will review uh, as we get closer to the exam is the artistic time periods. I have like a massive 300 slide PowerPoint that I have to wean down. Um, that that keeps, has a lot of stuff on the art. You made it. Um, it's like cut and pasted of like 40 different PowerPoints of all the <laughs> artistic yeah. periods. Do you know which monarchs feel like important and like not that important to the statue? I would be very surprised if there's any monarchs that are more important than the statue. Yeah. I would be no, I would be really really shocked if you got any question that. With the exception of the really big ones, the Louis the Fourteenth, right. the Peter the Great. I'd be really shocked if you got a question that asked you, oh, no, you know, uh, Louis XI did what? Um, I like to give you guys that stuff just so you've heard it once or twice. Okay. And if you're writing the free response question, maybe you could throw that in. Okay. But I would be absolutely floored. So, yeah, if I'm you, I'm not trying to memorize mm -hmm. when Louis and Henry's and uh, all the different, and Phillips and all those guys are governing. But you want to know like the the mass of them and right. what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah, you drive yourself nuts if you try yeah. to remember all the monarchs. Yeah. So, um, you know, know the Louis of France, the Frederick Williams right. of Prussia, the Josephs of Austria. Right. In general, there's like that one name that you can capture. So. Do you ever get the test? Like the multiple choice? Never. The free response? They get three days after the test. They give us the free response book. So by like Monday, I think by Monday we should be on the books. No. I don't know why they don't publish more multiple choice because it really is like always like just such a secret. Um, so. Okay, if you don't have any other questions, you guys are, are more than free to go. Um, if you have questions or if you're right up the floor, feel free to hang out.